Deus não é grande é o título de um dos últimos livros do inglês Christopher Hitchens, uma das figuras mais importantes do jornalismo contemporâneo. Ex-trotskista, obstinado defensor da condenação do ex-secretário de Estado Henry Kissinger por crimes contra a humanidade, crítico da invasão americana ao Iraque, Hitchens, até o convicto, mergulhou durante anos no universo complexo das religiões para traçar um quadro demolidor de todos os dogmas da fé manipulados pelos homens através da história. Hitchens morreu no dia 15 de dezembro de câncer. Deixou 17 livros, a maior parte deles dedicada à crítica das religiões. Para Hitchens nunca houve salvação, nem nas religiões politeístas, nem nas monoteístas. Cristianismo, judaísmo e islamismo são interpretações de uma mesma invenção em nome das quais se cometem atrocidades. A fé acorrenta bilhões de pessoas aos preconceitos contra a mulher, contra o sexo e contra o desenvolvimento da ciência. A religião, diz ele, envenena tudo. Foram essas as ideias que Hitchens veio defender em novembro de 2007, num ciclo de conferências em Porto Alegre. Na ocasião, gravou uma conversa com o Milênio, que vamos rever agora. Christopher, let's try to follow for a while the chronology of your book and go back to Dartwood, England, when you were a nine-year-old boy. Back to Mrs. Jean Watts' classes of religion. She seems to be the first person that helped you to doubt of God's existence unintentionally. I guess everybody has gone through a similar experience in a certain stage of life, but the truth is that no matter how dogmatic and irrational the introduction in religion is, billions of people still prefer to embrace faith. How do you explain this uncontrollable need of God among human beings? I can only say that if we have to concede that for millions of people it's very real and very necessary, then we must also concede that for quite a large number of us, perhaps 10 to 15 percent, this need does not exist. For me, Mrs. Watts didn't tell me anything I didn't know. Uh, I did not suddenly have a, a moment on the road to Damascus. I used to believe something and now I don't believe it anymore. Or I used to believe this and now I believe something different. No. It was simply the way in which I discovered that I couldn't believe in the supernatural. <laughs> did not believe in it, could not believe in it. Mm. It's something a little different from a, a moment of conviction or from a eureka uh, type moment, but still a moment. I, 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 it became obvious to me that I was, as Pascal phrases it, so made that I cannot believe. As you say, you have written this book your entire life. Yes. If this long way... It's very kind of you, by the way, to notice <laughs> this, uh, this uh, acutely. But this long way that took you to your unquestionable objections to religious faith, was it easy or was it painful? Uh, I think it was less painful than the experience that many of my Christian or Muslim or Jewish friends have had of investing many years of their lives in a faith that proved to them to be worthless. Mm. For me it's an intellectual engagement with believers and with unbelievers trying to make people understand that the much the most beautiful life is the one that studies reason, irony, literature, science, humor, and the other things that make uh, one's life worth living, that we don't owe anything to a supernatural dictatorship. I wonder if this has something to do with our fragility, our essence of glass. This is a beautiful definition of uh, the French script writer Jean-Claude Carrière, who wrote about our fragility, essence of glass. There's no, there's no doubt of it in my mind. We are a partly rational species that is full of fear, uh, fear of death, uh, fear of the unknown, fear of the dark, but it is also a very conceited species, unlike most other animals 
but we believe that the universe is designed with us in mind. It's easy to persuade us that this is not an accident. We, we must be the center of the object for this. Of course. Now, between our fear and our egotism, it's extremely easy to sell religion to us. Of course we would be the center of the world. The sun revolves around our earth. N nothing would be more likely. Everything is about me. Moi. Yes, it takes a lot to grow out of this nonsense. Your book fully illustrates how harmful religions have been throughout the centuries and how many atrocities men have committed and still commit in the name of God. Not in the name of God, because of the belief in God. But at the same time, there are reasons behind it. And these reasons are the constant struggle for domination and expansion, as well as the constant fear of um, the different, fear and despise for the different. Do you yes. believe that without religion, this struggle would come to an end? No. I'll give you an example. Uh, Christianity is stolen from Judaism and Islam is stolen from Christianity and Judaism. And these are plagiarisms, but the original monotheism is that of the covenant between God and the Jewish people, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Well, according to the Jews, God tells them to pray every morning. The men have to say, thank God I'm not a woman. And the women have to pray, thank God I am the way I am. And both have to thank God that they're not a, a Gentile or a slave. Well, obviously, this is not decided by God, it's designed by man, by men, mm -hmm. to be exact, masculine, uh, so that they can keep women in their place. That's easy. Uh, only a fool can't see that. Okay? God did not decide this. Men used religion to own women. <coughs> However, the impulse of men to own women would be there if they believe in God or not. It's just that it might be a bit harder to persuade female babies that they should be owned by men if they were not told that God wants it to be true. If all they're told is men want it to be true, they're not going to be very surprised. Tell them that God wants it to be true, then they may put up with it. The same with slavery. God wants people to be slaves? That's different from just men wanting to own other people. <clears throat> so that with the use of religion, the invention of the deity, you can uh, disguise what would otherwise be obviously a man-made ramshackle hypocritical dictatorship. Mm. So that getting rid of the idea of the supernatural is one step, only one, but a very important one. Perhaps the first one, perhaps the biggest one, on the road to emancipation. Until reading your book, I never realized how many divine creators have been born from virgin women as Mary. You say, Buddha, Krishna, Perseu, Horus, Mercury. Several Aztec gods. I think there's, uh, there's no god that I know of in history. I have a whole paragraph of this. That have been... It, I say history, in mythology. Uh -huh. That has not been born of a virgin. It would have been impossible for Christianity to sell itself as a religion if it did not continue this Egyptian, Aztec, Persian, uh, Mongol tradition. Even Buddha is born from a slit in his mother's side. Anything but the birth canal, anything but the vagina. This unclean but vessel, uh, God has for some reason used only one way street. But was this the eternal fear of sex or perhaps uh, the need that uh, make an origin for God that uh, would be different from the human biological system? It's the religious fear of sex, certainly, but it's also the male revulsion from what it most desires. Men need women, and they don't like the fact that they need them. They need them terribly. They hate the fact that they need them. They have experienced a disgust about this fact. Religion makes that into a system and consecrates it. Um, my first wife was Greek Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Eastern Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, when she was having her monthly period, she wasn't allowed to go to the church. Certainly not to take the sacrament of Mass. I think that used to be true at any rate of the Western Orthodox, the Roman Catholic as well. It's certainly true of Judaism. And the revulsion from female menstrual fluids is very common, of course, also in Islam and in all other cults. 
This comes from human anthropology. It does not come from heaven. It does not come from the sky. It doesn't come from the planets. It doesn't come from the sun and the moon and the stars. It comes from the base, very primitive forms of human anthropology. And it's the first thing to know about it.